Hi, welcome to Keto Life Support, where we make your keto life sustainable, fun, and low stress. I'm Kim Howerton from theketonist.com, and I'll be coming to you weekly with some of my keto besties to bring you the practical, real-world keto advice that you need. Quick disclaimer, I am not a doctor, and even if we have a doctor in the house, he or she is not your doctor, and nothing on this show should be taken as medical advice. Always check with a trusted medical professional about your personal medical concerns. everybody. Welcome back to Keto Life Support. This is Kim Howerton and I am joined today by the lovely Carrie Brown. Hello. And uh, hey, Carrie, what's been going on? Oh, so much. So much. I don't even remember when we last talked, but um, a lot. Life has been busy. Summer has been crazy busy. I think there was a keto fest and I've had a bunch of awesome guests who came to hang out and been working on new stuff and been working on a new cookbook and we've done a few more Happy Healthy Ketos, which have all been wildly successful, and here we are. Somehow, it got to fall. I know. It's fall officially now, which is crazy talk. It's beautiful. Is it getting cooler there yet? You know, it's for most of my life... In America, which has been well, nearly 19 years now, I lived in Seattle, and I never understood why most of the rest of America was like, yay, fall, we love fall, fall's awesome. And I was like, it's damp and cold and gray. Like, why is everybody so excited about fall? And then I moved to Connecticut. And now, all of a sudden, I'm like, fall's the best because I just spent three months in Connecticut, like, sweating my little tush off. And so now I understand why the rest of America likes fall because the rest of America isn't gray and drizzly and um, cold. Got it. Fall. Got it. Yeah. So, in, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area where September and October are our warmest months. So we have summer where so many people are having fall, but it'll be fall like by, by Halloween here. Yeah, no, it's definitely started. I actually took myself off on a little road trip, took the day off on Sunday and drove up to Vermont because I thought maybe the fall colors would have started uh -huh. up there being further north and they really haven't. Um, but it's definitely coming. Um, it's still 80 degrees during the day here, but it's definitely cooler at night and cooler in the morning. But it's just, it's so, so pretty and it's so nice that it's not a million degrees anymore. Nice. So yeah, yay fall. I have finally understood why fall is awesome. Nice. So people may not have yet guessed, but we were going to talk about fall today, but specifically, the, uh, though we often start with weather. That's just human, I guess. That's how we, that's how we greet each other. Uh, the British are famous for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we are going to talk about fall food because so much of eating well is about eating with the seasons. And uh, so fall brings about its own special foods. Um, and some of them are not keto, so we're not going to be talking about those. But many of them are fabulously easy. Okay, I just said they aren't keto. And I know keto <laughs> isn't. It isn't a food. It's a way of eating. But are not easily adapted to a ketogenic lifestyle. How about that? And uh, other foods are. Or you just have to be super, super, super careful about what else you've eaten that day and your serving size. Yeah, but yeah, but some of them are not ideally suited to a ketogenic lifestyle in my opinion. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course, as always, it depends also to some extent on you. If you're incredibly insulin resistant, even things that the people who don't struggle with that are going to be okay with, you won't be. So, yeah, absolutely. So we're going to stick towards the the sort of things that uh I find in some fashion, most people can 
work in easily to a ketogenic diet. Okay. Uh, so, Carrie, what do you look forward to about fall food items? Well, again, being relatively new to, I say relatively new, I've been here nearly 19 years, but I still feel like I'm relatively new in <laughs> America. Um, I was struck on my trip up to Vermont the other day, um, being where I am in Connecticut, and Vermont, there are at least a billion farm stands or little farmers market things that passed. And I stopped at one of them because they had these beautiful Indian corn things, which I didn't buy to eat. You buy them to decorate. They're, you know, the, 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 cold, the dry the thing, red, orange and whatever. So I, because I'd never seen those before. So I stopped and I remember standing in line at the little checkout and all I could see pretty much as far as I could see was squash. And I, this is a relatively new thing for me in, in England. We have what we call marrow, which are like completely oversized zucchini. Mm. Uh, enormous. And they're awesome. And I love them, but I haven't really seen them here. And then we have zucchini or courgette as we call it. But we don't have, or certainly when I left 19 years ago, we didn't have this kind of huge variety of all these different squashes. So this to me is a, a very American thing. And I was standing there in line and there was just so many squashes, half of which I don't even recognize. So maybe you could help. Just is there a, a dividing line on which squash we're okay with? on keto and which squash we're not because well, you're I, way more of a squash expert than I am. <laughs> definitive guide to squash. Yes. Uh, I think for, for, for me, it's very much about the carb count on the squash. So there are summer squashes and there are winter squashes, which has to do generally speaking with when they're harvested. Although winter squash might be a little misleading as some of them are really fall harvests. But, they, but you continue to eat them into the uh, winter. And a lot of that depends upon where you live in the States um, and other places in terms of the climate, such as if you live in Australia, nothing we're saying makes any sense whatsoever. <laughs> as your seasons are the opposite of our seasons, so it's uh, backwards land. Um, so uh, in terms of squashes, though, summer squashes, for the most part, are the lowest carb squashes. They have the lowest amount of starch. Uh, and so those tend to be pretty uh, generally easy to work into a well-formulated ketogenic diet. Uh, in terms of the winter squashes, there's a... So what might define a winter squash? A summer squash you could eat raw. It, it has a soft skin. A winter squash is one where... Uh, it it has seeds inside. Well, I mean, they all have seeds, but you know, not big seeds. It kind of some of that goop. You have to scoop them out, like the inside of a pumpkin. Uh, that defines a winter squash. You need a very sharp knife to get into them. Um, and so they're like pumpkins, uh, kabucha, which is a Japanese pumpkin. Um, we've got like butternut squashes. So there are summer and winter squashes. Although this will vary exactly where you are and if you're in Australia because everything is backwards there not not that not that you're backwards but the seasons are backwards and so everything's upside down and backwards and uh, the seasons are reversed but in the states um, the summer squashes are like the zucchinis and there's little there's like other types there's like little yellow ones and all the names have just flown out of my head, but they're, they're generally squashes that you could eat raw. They have a soft skin. Yeah, they're a lot, they're a lot more watery. They, they're a lot more like cucumbers than, yeah. than they are the, the kind of the pumpkin-y kind of squashes. Right. And then winter squashes kind of as a general rule have a hard outside. If you thump on them with your fingers, they sound hollow because uh, they have a, they have sort of like meat around the outside and then there's a, 
center with large seeds and stringy stuff that you scoop out when you open it up and you need a very sharp knife to get into most of these. Things like pumpkin, as an example, or butternut squash. Uh, and then there's acorn squash. There's a lot. And for me, there's kind of a, of a mental dividing line between squashes that I find will work uh, of the winter squashes for ketogenic diets and ones that don't work so well. Like a pumpkin, uh, if you cook the, the, the meaty part of the pumpkin, you'll end up with something that's somewhere around seven or eight grams of carbs for a cup of it, right? Whereas butternut squash is about twice that much. And so when you've got the, the butternut squash, um, for me, it tends to be too far towards the too much starch end for me to want to include. Obviously, there's a little bit of wiggle room. Like if you're an athlete who is very carb tolerant and your carb limit is much higher, you might be able to do a little bit of that. Or if it's like a specific type of soup where there's actually very little butternut squash in it, there's just a, it's there for flavor, but it's actually very blended. You know, it, it becomes a bit of a gray area working it out. But in general, um, if something had more than like 10 grams of carbs for a cup of the meat, I'm going to find it, in my opinion, a little too carby for the average keto dieters trying to keep their total carbs under around 20 grams. Got it. There, there is, uh, and, and I'll put out an infographic on some of these carb counts on, uh, on squashes. I find that helpful. There is one mystery, uh, and I go back and forth on it, um, which is the kabucha squash. Not kombucha, that is fermented tea, but right. kabucha which is a really gorgeous squash. It's a, often called a Japanese pumpkin. It's like a slightly smaller pumpkin and, than, a pump, than a standard pumpkin we tend to see. And it's green and orange kind of mottled. It's very pretty. And um, anyway, for a, I've, there have been rumors. They're, they're one of the lower carb squashes. And then there are rumors that they're one of the higher carb squashes. And so it's really hard to know which way to go with that one. But I finally looked at it this way, which is in general, because if you've ever, have you ever tasted pumpkin? I would define it as unless to make pumpkin a dessert, you have to add quite a bit of sweetener because when you taste pumpkin in and of itself, it's not very sweet. Right. Whereas if you taste butternut squash without anything added to it, it's, it's pretty sweet. Right. And so, so, you, so if you can eat it without having to add a lot of sweetener, then don't eat it. Exactly. <laughs> and unfortunately, kabucha squash is amazingly sweet. It is delightfully sweet, which makes me tend to believe the people that say it's higher carb. Um, yeah. As an aside, I believe that that's where the – the sweetener bokeh sweet comes from it is indeed where the so that actually makes sense that it's super sweet of course when they extract whatever it is that makes the product bokeh sweet there they say that it's um you know non-caloric or very low caloric and, right. and no no um effect on blood sugar mm -hmm. and insulin but i think it's very new and a lot of what i read is like we're not entirely sure yet yeah, I, you know, when only one company is making a product and there's only information coming out of the comp that one company about that product, you're sometimes a little, I don't, you're a little hesitant. So your theory about if it doesn't need much sweet, don't eat it, reminded me immediately of another fabulous fall thing that I know Americans um, absolutely love, and that's cranberries. Oh, yeah. Cranberries are just completely tied up in our Thanksgiving experience in the States. Yeah. And, um, but you also, and again, comparing England to here, you also make a lot of cranberry things. Typically in England, the only thing we do with cranberries is make cranberry sauce. 
Whereas yeah. here, you can do all sorts of, and, and you do make cranberry things. It's a lot more of a thing here. And, but the, the rule about if it tastes, if it needs a lot of sweetener to be palatable, then it's probably okay to eat on a keto diet is very, very true with cranberries. Because unless you want, you know, your the inside of your mouth to like completely pucker up and drop off, you don't want to eat cranberries raw. Yeah, they are a tart experience. However, I love, love, love cranberries. And we both have uh, keto recipes for cranberry sauce. This so you do not, don't think that cranberries are off the table, ha <laughs> ha, um, because they're not. You can totally have cranberries. Just find yourself a good keto recipe. We both have them, um, and you're good to go with cranberries. Yeah, absolutely. And then as we get into the cooler months, it it definitely is time. It's it is that time. You know, it's it's across the board. Sort of that discussion we had about squashes. It's also true that it's a root vegetable sort of time. And there is this sort of general rule that people will tell you on keto where they say, eat above ground vegetables, don't eat root vegetables, to which I direct you to my earlier discussion of squash. Right. I say, yeah. And I, I think that, but I think that's, uh, and that's, not entirely accurate, but I think for people who don't want to get in the weeds about looking up carb counts or, or they're just new to keto, I think the look for the above ground veggies is a good kind of guideline to, to get you going. I, I think it's helpful to say avoid those until you want to get in the weeds and figure out the exact carb counts of stuff or until you want to know where you are on the, on the, carb daily carb intake scale then focusing on above ground veggies is a is a quite a good helpful rule especially if you're standing in the grocery store and you're looking at something and going oh can i have that or not it's quite a good tool to say about you know above ground yes yeah below absolutely. Ground, no. i think it's a useful rule i just think you know i mean radishes are sort of the darling of many keto eater and they are considered not in the above ground, right? So there are there are several of uh, of the several of things like that. Yeah, to speak quite poorly. So one of my favorite things, which have typically not been a favorite in America, but I think in the past few years that has changed a bunch. Fall means Brussels sprouts. I love them when they grow on the stalk like they're so. I love Brussels sprouts. So, and, and as I say, I think the, you know, these baby green cabbages, which is essentially what they are, have gained in popularity a lot over the last few years and particularly in the keto world because it, it, it means you can eat veggies. It's one of the things that you can eat a lot of with abandon if you're a vegetable eater. I, I will I will actually say that Brussels sprouts are not one of the lowest carb vegetables and I I I am I am often shocked at how little abandon can be given to Brussels sprouts but I digress. A lot of keto people are learning to love them because they can add bacon because they taste absolutely fabulous with bacon. There's, um, I know you, Kim, in your holiday cookbook. Yes, I have a Brussels sprout recipe. Have a bacony Brussels sprout recipe. Um, so yep, if, if you, you want to know something, I, I, I make them two ways and I prefer them my alternate way. Which is with? Lemon the zest. The lemon. Yeah. I like Brussels sprouts always. So yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a big Brussels sprout fan. And I, I, in a little egotistical moment, would like to say that I have apparently made a lot of Brussels sprout haters Brussels sprout lovers with my bacon and Brussels sprout chowder. So nice. there's that. Nice. I'm a big fan of uh, what I do is I parboil my Brussels sprouts because I don't like them too hard but just for like a couple minutes and then I cut them in half and I put them down face cut side down in a pan with a lot of butter 
And then I just leave them for a few minutes until they turn really dark brown, almost burnt, but not burnt, just really browned on the bottom from that butter. Uh, and then and then I toss them with lemon and lemon zest and maybe a hit a parm. That sounds terrible. Yeah, it's awful. They're yeah, awful. I, I wouldn't want to eat a bowl of that at, at all. Yeah, yeah. Those are, you know, those are delicious. And, one, and, a, and I think, you know, people have really come to ad- appreciate bitter flavors in a way that I don't think they did when I was a kid. And Brussels sprouts definitely have that bitter note. Well, I... So one thing to know is that if you're not a Brussels sprout lover, you may, it may be in part because you've not been having fresh fall season Brussels because Brussels, like if they are grown later in the season or in spring, they tend to be more bitter. So it may just be that you've eaten them at the wrong time. Now is the time to get the best Brussels, although you can get them all year, full, fresh, full Brussels will have the best, least bitter flavor. So if you're not a Brussels sprout lover, you may want to give them a try, get them now and try one of Kim's recipes or one of mine. I have them too. Um, So there's that. Okay. And one of, so there are a couple of, of other vegetables that I think are important to acknowledge two of which are uh, my favorite, or I should say one of which is my favorite and the other which I think is one of your favorites, both of which are slightly on the higher carb side, but within reason can be enjoyed. Uh, so I was thinking about you on Sunday when I was standing in line at the, the, at the farm stall because there was an enormous box of what I know you're about to say, and I was like, oh, Kim kohlrabi yep they had a whole box of it and i like every time i see kohlrabi uh kim and i had a fantastic eating dining experience when uh kim was here in connecticut with me almost a year ago unbelievably um and so i forever now have a this kim kohlrabi connection in my brain so yeah i was if you if you felt me on sunday it was because i was thinking about you while i was standing next to this Uh bucket of kohlrabi so kohlrabi, if people haven't ever seen it, it looks sort of like a potato with lot, but it's green or purple, a beautiful green, like light green or a bright kind of like red cabbage purple. Um, it's like it's like a little sphere, and then it's got arms shooting out of it of the same color. It's got like all these tendrils. Um, you cut that whole the skin and all those things off, and you use the inside almost like a potato, and texture wise and uh it's very much like a potato to me in a lot of ways and it's you you can use it in a lot of ways you might use a potato but it has a subtle flavor of broccoli but very subtle so it's um it's it's a very mild vegetable and one of my favorites is that's also more wintry. Well, it's at its best in the cooler months of fall and winter is celeriac, otherwise known as celery root. And again, it is a little bit carbier, but it's way, way, way less carby than potatoes. And it has a very a similar kind of almost mealy texture if you mash it a bit like potato. So, but it has a very, it's not, it doesn't taste like celery, but it, it kind of, it's more exciting than potato. It has more flavor than potato, but it's not really celery. It's just, it's got an interesting flavor that I. A little bit like to me is if you've ever eaten the little tender inner leaves of celery, sort of that, that flavor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's and, it, and it's not spicy, but there's a little something. But I absolutely love um, celeriac. Again, if you're super, super um, insulin insulin bleh, insulin resistant, you're not going to want to eat too much of it. Um, but if you're not and you really miss potato, a small amount of that could go a long, long way to keep your keto palate excited. I love celeriac. Well, and there's another thing that I was thinking about 
that is starts with an L that you also love? <laughs> oh, leeks. Yes. I was going to say lettuce. I'm like, wait, lettuce grows everywhere all year. What <laughs> Leeks. So yes, leeks are, and again, I think, and I think we talked about this when we did our spring episode is that it can be very confusing because pretty much you can go into a grocery store and get anything you want most of the year right. now, right. which means we've lost our natural ability to eat with the seasons because we don't actually know what the season, which is where the farmer's market comes in because the farmer's markets typically will only have what they actually like just dug out of the ground now. So farmer's markets are a good way to actually figure out what is in season. Um, yes, leeks are in season and I love leeks and confusing but true is that the carb content of cooked leeks is significantly less than raw leeks. So I still can't figure out the science on that situation. <laughs> I can't either. But every every database I've looked at reports the same thing. So I don't know what that is. But um, And what does a leek taste like? It's like a very, very mild onion that doesn't make you cry when you chop it up. Yeah, it's almost like a scallion. The, yeah, the so a leek part. to look at. Yeah, if you've never seen a leek, a leek is like an inc a huge scallion or green onion. Like the, the base, it's like an inch and a half fat, whereas a scallion is like, you know, tiny, like your finger. A leek is just like an inch and a half fat. So that's what it looks like. So they end up being in the stores like 12 to 18 inches long and they're, they're fat. But they taste, they're in the onion family and I absolutely love leeks. And if you, I find that they are my, uh, typically my pasta, my noodle substitute. Sure. Because you chop them finely and saute them on a very low heat. So almost so they just, they, they melt, they, 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 they just almost braise in butter that they look like noodles and to me I can eat a plate of that and feel like I just ate a bowl of noodles so I'll, I'll cook leeks like that I'll sweat them in a pan in butter and then you know put them in a bowl or on a plate and then put whatever topping my my bolognese or you know whatever saucy thing i've got on top and that to me has has always been my pasta my noodle replacement okay so other than stuff that's coming into harvest what i also think of the fall as a time of kind of more comfort food is kind of coming into popularity so stews and soups and roasts and because in the summer you don't want to heat up the kitchen so it's all about the barbecue but as we get into fall and we and it's getting colder cooler rain cooler days um, people are definitely cooking low and slow doing doing more braises stews things like that yep and now's the time when everyone, certainly in the, uh, our kitchen group, and I'm sure in the keto life support uh, group, we're going to start talking about, I want soup and who has crock pot recipes. And so this is the season when that's all the thing. And I would highly recommend that you, if you have one, uh, crack open your crock pot because there's so many cool things you can cook in a crock pot that also means not only do you have that comfort food factor, but they can also save you a massive amount of time. A good crock pot recipe will take you minutes to prepare and then all the hard work is done while you're at work or off having fun or sleeping and then you come back, lift the lid scoop it out and dinner or or whatever meal it is you're eating is done so i'm a big fan of the crock pot both for the comfort factor but also the hands-offness that a good crock pot recipe will will bring to your life nice i do not own a crock pot i have an instant pot but i don't have a crock pot do you have the instant pot that has a crock pot setting i don't know 
So most of the instant pots have a, well, I shouldn't say crock pot because that's a brand name, have a slow cooker setting. And when I was writing my the keto crock pot cookbook, I actually, I had one crock pot, but I had to have two. Otherwise, it would have taken me years to get this thing done because the crock pot was in use for like 12 hours at a time. Um, I, I wanted to buy a second one, but then I realized that instant pots have a slow cooker setting. So I bought an instant pot and I did half of the recipes in an instant pot on the slow cooker setting. So you should check that and see. You may not have to buy a crock pot. You can just use your slow cooker setting. I and assume have it does. I inherited it because my dad got a wild sort of hair that he decided he was going to cook in the instant pot. He used it once. He hated it. He's like, do you want an instant pot? And so I, I inherited his instant pot. But knowing my dad, it, it has all the bells and whistles. I just haven't investigated. I knew there was a reason I like your father, and I haven't even met him. <laughs> I, I'm not. I, it's it's no secret that I'm not a fan of the instant pot, but I love my instant pot for being able to put it, use it as a slow cooker. So, however, and I gotta say that not crock potting kind of makes sense for you because of where you live. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, and also, also, I don't have that big a kitchen, so the number right. of storage spots i've got are limited right and also there's two of you i think crock potting is more suited to families simply because you don't want to make a meal for one in an entire crock pot but if you're if you're single or a couple and you both work crock potting could be magical because you can make a regular you know six person recipe eat a third of it freeze two thirds of it and then you've made three dinners in one so right. and absolutely and the other yeah i and i also work from home most days so i can have the stove on all day whereas that is a big high fire hazard to leave if you have to leave the house yeah so crock i'm a, i'm a big big fan of slow cooking for yeah. all of those reasons and i highly recommend that my keto bestie here digs out her instant pot and tries a few slow cooker things all right. I, I'm a big fan of the Instant Pot for uh, doing certain meats at this point that are best on a slow cook braise, right. but you can do them in a pressure cooker like the Instant Pot as well. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm totally a fan of the Instant Pot when it comes to things like, you know, cooking the tougher cooks of meat that generally right. take all day that I think that the instant pot is fantastic. It's just, yeah, perfect. I will go out on a limb here and say, I am also on team. Why the hell are you doing that with an instant pot? Yes. There's just certain things. I don't see a reason to do them in your instant pot. Yes. When it's actually faster on a stove top or more controllable as well. Or more controllable. And then there are certain things where I really honestly, I mean, people, we're going to get hate mail on this one. <laughs> but I, uh, there are certain things where I'm like, I'm going through a, like a, somebody will come out with an instant pot cookbook and I'll go through it and I'll get to a section where there's suddenly like four recipes. And I'm like, why the hell would you do this in an instant pot? And I'm like, did you just have a page number you had to hit on this cookbook? So you decided to adopt like all of these recipes for an instant pot that really would have been better in the oven? I, and it's interesting that you and I have never talked to each other about this, but we are completely on the same page. And, and, I, and I know that there's a lot of people who love their instant pot and that's awesome. Go for it. If your instant pot makes you happy, you use it. But for me, I find it's typically quicker to just do it on the stovetop, except when it comes to those, you know, cooking those, those meats right. that take a long time, then it makes sense. So I would only use an instant pot for the things that my mother would have used a pressure cooker for 100 years ago, which is not a lot of things. So, but that's me. And, and I, I have absolutely nothing against anybody who loves their instant pot. I just don't I think really, you're wrong. I don't get it. 
I just don't get it. But I do get it for use as a slow cooker. That makes total sense to me. Okay. So, all right, all right. sounds good. Um, so my s- well, go ahead. I was just going to say the other thing that's great about fall is soups. And again, for a lot of the reasons, slow cooking is that you can make a big old bucket of soup and eat some now and then either have some for tomorrow and the next day or if you're not a leftover person, you can freeze soup. So you can make multiple meals at once and really cut down on the time you spend cooking um, if you make soup. Soups are kind of magical for that. Yeah, and they freeze so well. They freeze so well and they're super portable. You could, you know, if you've got your, your if, you, if lunch or meal one is something that you eat out, maybe at the office, soups are brilliant because you can just pre-portion them into Pyrex, put them in the fridge, grab one as you run out the door and you've got a full keto meal there, which you can just microwave at the office. So soups are also magical for time saving and batch cooking and on all of that good stuff. So I'm a big fan of soups. Thanks. So is there something that you grew up eating in the winter? I'm sorry, in the fall, we're not in winter yet, uh, that you grew up eating in the fall that you've adopted to your ketogenic way of eating. That's a personal fave. So my, one of my favorite foods in life, the universe and everything is beets mm. or what we call in England beetroot. And I'm looking at Kim's face and she's going, you did not just <laughs> say that. And so hear me out. Beet gate. <laughs> so beet gate, yes. So how I deal with beet gate now is I will – buy and of course this is not specific to the season because you can get them all year is that i will buy fermented beets and that is how i typically add get my my pre and probiotics in is that i will have a you know a spoonful or a forkful of fermented beets every day with my meal so that's but beets are a very full vegetable. That's how I still enjoy them. But I also get the benefits of, of eating that fermented food. And you only need a forkful. You don't, you're not ever intended to eat a huge amount of these. So that kind of, that works for me in, in fitting my favorite things still into my ketogenic diet. Got it. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm a big fan of beets as well. In, in general, uh, but I don't eat them anymore because for me personally, they are too carby. Yeah. But I remember being a kid and just eating an entire can of pickled beets. I, that flavor was, you know, they're very high in sugar, um, which is why I liked them so much. Anyway. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a huge fan and in pickled beets or just especially hot cooked Beets that have just been peeled and are fresh, hot. I just, I absolutely love beets. And, and I'm, I'm not, I have different goals to you and I'm not right. as insulin resistant and, and just having my fork full of fermented beets every day kind of works for me and for my goals. Right. And when, back in the day when I did low carb but not keto, beets were on my menu. Um, but they're just, they just add up too fast and I also have no self-control. <laughs> uh, period. Really, right. generally speaking, yeah. Uh, right. That's why I'm, ab- I'm an abstainer. Um, so yeah, I I could uh, let me think. What what do I love? I mean, I love this kind of year round, but it's especially great. Is a really nice braised short rib is what I tend to really love this time of year. Um, or uh, one of the things that I also love, which reminds me of Hanukkah. Um, so I'm half Jewish, half Christian, although, you know, just from my families. Um, and so I have a, a, a wide variety of holiday celebrations in my childhood. And I remember my aunt Ellen always cooking what I affectionately refer to as Jewish brisket, uh, which is different than Texas brisket. Very different. 
Uh, Jewish brisket is is a braised situation, very saucy, got kind of a tomato based sauce, and is is more stewed, uh, not barbecuey. Yeah. And I'm not an expert on brisket because British. And right, do you guys not have that cut at all? Um, if we do, we don't call it that. And, of course, we don't barbecue like Americans. So Right. And I never had barbecued brisket until I went to Texas. And so there I had some, and I thought it was good, but it did not live up to the situation I grew up with. Which Because if you like, you know, it's, it's a – it's got this slow, long cook in like a tomato-based sauce and it, it kind of pulls apart and it's this, anyway, it's like, just like, you know, these tougher cuts of meat can turn out to be some of the most delicious uh, meals when you cook them right. Yep. And short ribs being top of that list of, and the reason short ribs are so tasty is because they're so, so, so fatty. It's one of the fattiest cuts of beef so short ribs for the win yeah absolutely and also they well certainly they were they used to be one of the cheapest cuts of meat too but i think maybe we we, we've we've made them popular and so now they're going up in price but um yeah short ribs are awesome i've just had a thought actually going back to vegetables just for a minute is that onions although you can get onions all year they the most onions are harvested in late summer and fall. And so a good reminder that you should stick with your white and yellow onions and steer away from the red and sweet onions because the carb content is different. Yes. I have had many, many discussions with my father about these onions and he's confused. He's still confused. And also shallots, and I know people love shallots, but shallots are definitely down the carbier end of the way onion family. Carbier, way, way yeah. carbier. It is interesting. I've had this discussion in several keto groups where somebody said, well, I don't, you know, I had to change my, what I eat in onions because they're so carby, so now I eat shallots, to which I said, you do know those are higher carb yeah. than your average yellow onion. Uh, and, and yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah. They're delicious. And and again, it's one of those things that if you're using a teeny bit in like a uh, a sauce, a sauce or a dressing, I was trying to think of the word salad dressing. For some reason, it was escaping me. Or a <laughs> salad dressing, um, you know. But if you want to fry a bunch up in butter and put them on something, you're going to go overboard pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, you are. So we love shallots, and I think a lot of people go shallot, onion, onions are okay, therefore shallots are okay. So I just wanted to say that out loud so that, that people who maybe don't know the shallot story are aware that shallots, carby, red onions, sweet onions down the carbier end. And so just stick with your white and yellow onions and you'll be in a better place. And so another name for a sweet onion people might not know is a Vidalia. That's okay. another name that you'll hear on those. It might be a California thing, but a Vidalia onion is a sweet onion. So steer clear of those. Absolutely. Um, for me, I think really fall in England is, hmm, I'm trying to think of all the things that are, that are actually still keto because a lot of the, we're, we're big root vegetable eaters in England. Um, parsnips are a huge, huge favorite. Um, but of course I don't eat. If I eat those, I eat them in very tiny quantities now. Um, other than that, I think really the big thing for me as a Brit is cabbages and Brussels, which mm. we've already talked about. Yeah, and you said earlier that you use leeks as your sort of noodle replacement. Mm-hmm. I lean, I would lean, though I haven't done this in a long time, uh, but I lean towards um, cutting uh, cabbage real thin and right. eat that more like a noodle. Right, absolutely. And if you cut it right, if you almost shred it, mm-hmm. or, or you can actually buy um, shredded cabbage now. So Trader Joe's have bags of shredded cabbage if you don't want to deal with that. And that also, when they're cooked down, also can look exactly like noodles. So those on a plate with your bolognese or whatever other sauce on top can also look and feel and 
and feel remarkably like you're eating pasta as long as you don't cook it to a mush. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, cabbage, finely sliced cabbage, shredded cabbage and leeks are – oh, and also a mix of the two. Often I'll do, you know, half cabbage, half leeks to do that kind of pasta thing, right. and that's how I get my pasta fix. Right, and if you're somebody who is more carb – intolerant more carb sensitive um then uh you're going to want to lean towards the cabbage over the leeks but if yep. you've got a little more room to shake it up then the leeks yep. can be or just alter the ratio if you know you yeah. can do three quarters cabbage and a quarter leeks um which will just give you that extra little bit of flavor then then you can do that too yeah yeah so in terms of you know this time of year people often want mold sort of like cinnamony things and they're you know it's certainly to all the basic all the basics out there as they say these days uh the pumpkin spice season is upon us <laughs> yes it is um uh, and again i was kind of late to the pumpkin spice party because i grew up in england where we don't have pumpkins actually i think they have pumpkins have pumpkin. now there, I'd never seen a pumpkin until I moved here, but now when we're 19 years later, and I'm sure that they do Halloween in England. I understand they do Halloween in England. We, we never did Halloween when I was a kid growing up. I think they do Halloween now, so I think pumpkins are a lot more of a thing there now, but when, when I lived there, never seen a pumpkin, a real-life pumpkin. Could not get pumpkin in a can. Just you, you just – it wasn't a thing. So pumpkins are not my wheelhouse. I've done, you know, in my holiday cookbook, and I know you've done a lot of pumpkin things in your holiday cookbook, and I did do because so many people ask for pumpkin pie, so I've done a pumpkin pie, and I've done a few other. I've done a pumpkin um, spice latte ice cream, a keto ice cream, but really you're the pumpkin queen. Yeah, it's funny because I am, I am, I can be iffy on pumpkin. If you don't get the spices right when you're using pumpkin, it doesn't taste all that appealing. Like when I used to eat uh, not keto, um, I hated pumpkin spice lattes unless they had a copious amount of whipped cream on them because I find under sweet they were they weren't even sweet enough for me to overcome the pump. Anyway, I'm a mess apparently. Um, but now that I am keto, I, I do really enjoy using pumpkin in recipes because it imparts a certain richness if you get the balance right. So I have a pumpkin bread recipe that is out of this world. And it is actually, you would imagine it could be fairly high carb because, you know, almond flour and things like that are higher carb than a lot of other foods we might eat on keto. So, uh, and then you add pumpkin on top of it, which is a high carb vegetable. So I um, made a pumpkin bread recipe using uh, ground pork rinds as the flour. Of course you did. Of course I did. Because, you know, why not? And it, I have to say, is amazing. It is, it is you would never know. And uh, when, before Ken Berry became completely carnivore. It was his favorite bread in the world. I have still to play with your, all your pork rind stuff. Yeah, I, you know, I just found a sort of niche with it. Um, it really helps you cut back on carbs. And then it's also really helpful. Some people can't do nuts. And so working it into various baked goods can be very helpful. Um, and it's, I understand it's weird. <laughs> I have yet to be convinced. I trust you and I believe you, but I still need to make something and eat it. Yeah. I mean, the easiest thing and the thing most people sort of start with, they get their toe wet on is doing waffles or pancakes with them. That's a, more, that's an, a not uncommon application. Awesome. I'm going to um, I'm going to get there this year. I know, and I know you're not a big fan of the chaffle. Chaffle? The chaff. Mm -hmm. It's like it sounds like chattel. Exactly. Chattel, chaffle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, but the ch- this and it's a, in, if, in case any of our listeners have been hiding under a rock and haven't heard about this, it's, uh, I guess it got its name because it's just cheese and egg made in a waffle iron into basically a waffle. So it's like a, I think it's supposed to be like cheese waffle, ch- chaffle. Chaffle. Cha- mm-hmm. Is it chaffle or chaffle? <laughs> I say chaffle, uh, Carl says chaffle. <laughs> I think it should rhyme with waffle. And I think it should rhyme with chattel. Okay. Well, anyway, I, um, I am not a big fan because I'm not really doing much dairy these days. So I haven't actually succumbed to, but I did, I did buy a mini dash waffle maker because I like making waffles and I don't have room for a big waffle maker. So I did find the little mini waffle maker very useful. And it's not that I'm not a fan. I, I just, I'm, it's my personality type that if there's a craze, I'm running the other way. You are resistant. <laughs> I am craze resistant. So, um, and, you know, there's tons of other people out there that have done the chaffle thing to death. So I don't feel like I need to add my two cents to the chaffle I understand. Thing. But I, you know what bothers me? I am a little bit of a stickler. So, you know, there's this craze for the chaffle, 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 chaffle. <laughs> and then people will be like, oh, I made one with this and that and the other thing. And I'm like, that's just a waffle. <laughs> right, exactly. That was the other thing. Chaffle. Yeah, for the first few weeks, it, a chaffle was cheese and egg with a few other things thrown in. People started getting creative. But now the vast majority of things that are called chaffles are not cheese or egg. <laughs> they're, they're just almond flour mixtures cooked in a waffle. And so they're just waffles. They're not chaffles. So, yeah, that was an, – and then it all just got a bit crazy for me. And I just kind of went, okay, I don't need to focus on – chaffles got it if you love chaffles have at it i'm thrilled for you i just didn't feel i needed to add my two cents to the chaffle discussion i understand there was some somebody posted in one of the groups that she um wasn't a very good cook like she and she'd never used the waffle iron but she decided to use the waffle iron that belonged to her husband because she thought well i'll just try it and i'll make it but there are a few details about a waffle iron you need to know before you make anything in a waffle iron. And so I think she ruined their waffle iron. Oops. <laughs> and I, I'm totally not being snobby about chaffles. If, uh, and this goes for, no, 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 I'm not. No, if people, if it helps them, if it makes them happy, if it makes it possible for them to stay on keto, if they've, if it's given them something to re ignite their love of keto foods if it helps them in any way i'm all for it you go chapel people you go chapel i'm i just as i say didn't feel i needed to add my two cents to it um and i haven't made one and i haven't bought a dash but i'm not totally if it works for you and it helps you reach your goals and you love them you chapel on yeah absolutely i am not at all opposed to the concept. I simply wish it had a better name. <laughs> yeah. So there we are not chaffle haters, although the last few minutes may have made it sound like we're totally not. We just did feel the need to No, I just it's more about the branding. Train. The branding is bad for me. Yeah. All right. So we should we wrap this situation up? Sure, because, and I think, well, it's just, you know, we, we, a lot of the full discussion really kind of bleeds into holidays, right? Because that's the culmination, but we're going to do other episodes on holiday. So we really don't need to do that now. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, in the, in the coming months, we are going to focus on holiday recipes. So those will be coming to you next month and so if we mentioned any vegetables that are useful on keto that you haven't tried my little challenge to you is to go buy some yeah. and try them yep absolutely hit up your local farmer's market they you can go to them almost everywhere these days and it's a great way to get to know what is actually in season versus what your grocery store has imported from chile 
today. And tell us what you think of leeks and tell us what you think of kohlrabi and celeriac and tell us some new way you found to cook Brussels sprouts that you love that makes them edible for you. Yeah, and absolutely. And if we've shared some vegetables that you're not familiar with, look them up on the internet so you see what they look like. You can usually find a picture and also look up the carb count before you buy a lot of them so that you don't go, oh no, what do I do now by the time you get them home? Right. And of course, the one of the good things about vegetables is that you can buy them one. You can buy one. If you go where they're not prepackaged and chopped, you can buy a you can buy a tiny kohlrabi or you can buy a small cabbage or you can buy a small amount of Brussels sprouts because normally they're all sold by low. Or you can buy one leek and you can try them and if they're not for you, then you haven't wasted a ton of money. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, one tip for the cabbage lovers is green cabbage is lower carb than red cabbage. Also a lot easier to make into delicious things. My mother used to make red cabbage when I was a kid and it was a hot dish. So yeah. you, you'd eat it with, with, with meat. And, but she put some kind of non-keto things in. But when I later in life, when I was on my own, I got red cabbage and cooked it like red, green cabbage. And it was like, whoa, like I'm not going to do that again. So yeah. I think red cabbage takes a lot more work and other things to make it really tasty so that's another reason why focus on your green cabbage absolutely all right people well we hope you have a wonderfully adventurous fall in terms of your keto foods and we will be back well i'll be back next week but carrie will be back next month to discuss our holiday preparations yay holidays all right guys we hope you have a fabulous week if you'd like to join us in keto life support uh, and if you can't find that link for the Facebook group, you can go to ketolifesupport.com and you'll find the link there. Uh, you'll also find show notes and at some point transcripts in uh, at ketolifesupport.com. Yay! Okay, guys. Hope you're doing well. See you later. See ya. Thank you so much for joining us on Keto Life Support. If you'd like more, you can join our friendly Facebook group, Keto Life Support. Can't find it? Go to ketolifesupport.com. If you ever want to suggest a topic for discussion, that would be the place to do it. We'd really, really appreciate it if you would go to your podcast app and subscribe because that's awesome. And what would be super awesome is if you'd be so kind as to write a review for us. Though we would love it if that review was awesome, just writing a review is all we ask. So have a fabulous Keto Week and we'll see you next time.